a humble English maid found herself at the center of an extraordinary tale involving an 18th century kidnapping. We embark on a journey to uncover the truth, was she truly a victim of abduction, or was there more to this story than met the eye? Elizabeth Canning came into the world in 1734, born to William, a carpenter, and Elizabeth, a dressmaker, right in the heart of London City. She was the eldest of their children, and as four more siblings would later join the family, young Elizabeth took on the responsibility of caring for them. While the Cannings resided in the relatively affluent neighborhood of Aldermanbury, their own financial situation was far from prosperous. To make ends meet, they even had to rent out one of their two rooms to a student named James Lord. From her early years, Elizabeth's life demanded hard work, and her educational opportunities were limited to a few months in a local parish school where she acquired basic reading and writing skills. Elizabeth was not considered a beauty, she stood at a mere 1.5 meters in height and had a plump figure. Her face bore the marks of smallpox, featuring widely set eyes and a prominent straight nose. At the age of 15, her parents arranged for her to work as a maid in the household of a tax collector named John Wintleberry. He later praised her as a diligent, honest, and exceptionally efficient worker. After two years in Wintleberry's service, she transitioned to work for Edward Lyon, the owner of the carpenter's shop. Disappearance this intriguing episode unfolded on the night of January 1, 1753, a time when Elizabeth had been in Edward Lyon's employ for nearly a year. The day prior, December 31st, she had a rare day off and chose to spend it with her family in Aldermanbury. During the afternoon, Elizabeth and her mother made a decision to pay a visit to her uncle and aunt, Thomas and Alice Colley, who resided in close proximity to the London docks. As evening descended, Mrs. Canning set out for home, as she had some errands to attend to at a couple of local stores. Elizabeth, on the other hand, remained in the company of her relatives. She set out for her own residence when the clock had already struck 9 p.m. The affectionate Thomas and Alice, who cherished their niece, escorted her on her way. Around 9.20 p.m., the trio arrived at Houndstooth Street, a mere ten-minute walk from Elizabeth's home. The young lady expressed a sense of security in the neighborhood, believing that no harm would befall her. After bidding her niece farewell with a kiss, Thomas and Alice reversed their path and headed home. However, more than an hour elapsed, and Elizabeth's mother, anxiously waiting at the doorstep of her house, transitioned from impatience to distress as her daughter failed to return. The passage of time past midnight heightened her apprehension causing her to fear the gravest of possibilities, worrying that her eldest daughter might have met with foul play, be it murder or kidnapping. The Search On the following day, word of Elizabeth's sudden vanishing rapidly circulated throughout the Aldermanbury neighborhood. The community, known for their empathy, did not remain indifferent to Mrs. Canning's anguish, instead, they rallied to her aid. Neighbors joined forces, pooling together funds earmarked for a reward, to be given to anyone who could provide vital information about the young girl's whereabouts. A portion of this money was dedicated to publishing advertisements in multiple newspapers and distributing flyers across the town. These notices offered a reward of two guineas to anyone whose information could lead to the discovery of Elizabeth. As the weeks unfurled, a month passed without any word on the 18-year-old's fate. The lone lead in this enigmatic puzzle was an account of a woman's scream emanating from a hired carriage on the fateful night of January 1st. This incident occurred near Houndstead Street, though the details surrounding it remain shrouded in mystery. Appearance Then, in a most unexpected turn of events, on January 29th, Elizabeth Canning reappeared at her parents' doorstep in Aldermanbury. Her appearance was distressing she was hobbling and, despite the bitter cold, she was only half-clothed, donning a shirt, underskirt, and undergarments. A grim wound marred her left ear, and a blood-soaked cloth was hastily fastened around her head. The frail young woman struggled to cross the threshold into the house, and her mother, upon beholding her injured daughter, was so overcome with shock that she fainted. After regaining consciousness and settling Elizabeth at the table, she discovered contusions on her daughter's arms and body. In a harrowing account, the unfortunate girl recounted that shortly after bidding farewell to her uncle and aunt, she had been assaulted near Bedlam Hospital by a duo of ruffians. 
It appeared that one of these malefactors had struck her on the head, causing her to lose consciousness for a period. Captivity and Escape When Elizabeth gradually regained consciousness, she realized she was being forcibly dragged along the ground, yet her weakened state rendered her powerless to resist. Eventually, she found herself in an unfamiliar house, cast at the feet of an elderly woman. Two young women in the room wore sly, contemptuous expressions that instantly signaled to Canning that she had been brought to a brothel. The elderly woman produced a knife and cut the laces of the young maid's corset, crudely inspecting her physique. After this invasive examination, she inquired whether Elizabeth would comply with their intentions. Elizabeth firmly declined, prompting the brothel's proprietor to retort with a grim promise that she would eventually come to her senses. Subsequently, the older woman led the terrified girl upstairs and confined her to a bleak room where she endured a grueling four-week period. In an attempt to break the maid's spirit, she was provided with nothing more than moldy bread and water. The captive endured relentless chill as the sole source of warmth in the room emanated from the fireplace grate. As the days wore on, with no sign of rescue, Elizabeth resolved to make her escape. Within a few days, she managed to loosen one of the wooden boards that had been nailed to the window. However, the height from which she would need to descend was perilous, leading her to climb onto the roof and ultimately lower herself to the barn before taking the final leap onto a desolate street below. Her daring escape unfolded under the cover of night, obscuring her surroundings, but Elizabeth believed that the house where she had been held captive was situated on Hartford Street, approximately 16 kilometers from her home. She wandered aimlessly for a time until, an hour later, she recognized familiar streets. Several hours later, she finally made it back to her family's home. Investigation when Mrs. Canning told her neighbor, Robert Scarrett, about Elizabeth's ordeal, he said he knew the place well. I'd wager a guinea that the house where Liz was held captive was Mother Wells' brothel, someone speculated, expressing a prevailing suspicion. Elizabeth offered a partial confirmation of this conjecture, acknowledging that she had overheard the name Wells or Wills mentioned in the house on multiple occasions. Her unfamiliarity with Enfield Wash, where Susanna Wells supposedly resided, made it challenging for her to definitively pinpoint the location of her captivity. However, the news of the girl's return and her incriminating statements about her potential kidnapper swiftly circulated throughout the town, galvanizing a group of enterprising citizens to converge on Wells' residence. At the brothel, a crowd of around a hundred people soon arrived at the doorstep of the elderly woman's house, with several of them emphatically knocking on the door. As Susanna answered, she was promptly pushed aside by a throng of individuals, driven by a palpable sense of moral outrage. Within the house, they quickly discovered an upstairs room that bore a resemblance to the one described by Elizabeth. It contained scattered hay on the floor, a jug of water, and even the old saddle mentioned by the captive. However, there was no trace of the fireplace grate that Elizabeth had alluded to. Moreover, the room's only window opened onto the street and was so petite that it seemed implausible for the young girl to have escaped through it. After some time, Elizabeth was brought into the house, where she identified the room where she had been confined, although her certainty was not as firm as when she recounted the details of her initial abduction. The enraged crowd seemed poised to take matters into their own hands and deliver a harsh judgment on Mrs. Wells. However, as Elizabeth gazed at Susanna, she struggled to recognize her as the woman who had held her captive. It wasn't until she spotted her friend, Mary Squires, another elderly gypsy, that the pieces of the puzzle fell into place. Instantly, she identified Squires as the one who had made the offensive proposal during her ordeal. The elderly women were taken aback, finding it hard to believe the accusations being leveled by the young Englishwoman, who now accused them of kidnapping. This is the old woman who undressed me and locked me in a room, Elizabeth declared, pointing her finger directly at Squires. Huh, Mary Squires, clearly bewildered, blinked in astonishment. When did I rob you? On New Year's Day, Canning exclaimed. That's nonsense. I was 180 kilometers away from London on that day, Mary retorted. Meanwhile, the other residents of the house stood nearby, aghast at the turmoil unfolding. 
Mary Squire's daughter, Lucy, and her friend, a strikingly attractive blonde courtesan named Virtue Hall, nervously surveyed their surroundings. Though Elizabeth could not definitively identify them, suspicion loomed that they might be the two women mentioned in her account. Amidst this gathering, Mary's stout son, George, a known tough character, was also present in the house. Many were inclined to believe he might have been one of the culprits, but Elizabeth's inability to clearly discern his face made it challenging to definitively attribute blame to him. Preliminary Hearings During the 18th century in England, incidents like these were not treated as criminal offenses by the authorities, but rather as civil disputes between two parties. Engaging in this process was not financially burdensome, Yet Elizabeth faced challenges in raising the necessary funds to initiate legal action against the alleged kidnappers. A few days later, Susan Wells and Mary Squires were formally charged with orchestrating the abduction and taken into custody. Throughout their detainment, they vehemently maintained their innocence. The case came under the jurisdiction of Justice of the Peace Henry Fielding, a noted writer and playwright. In the course of the legal proceedings, the accused women staunchly denied any wrongdoing prompting Fielding to turn his attention to Virtue Hall. Fielding's interrogation of Hall was so severe that it drove her to tears, and she appeared ready to divulge all the pertinent details. However, allegations of abuse and misuse of power were leveled against Fielding in his pursuit of obtaining the desired testimony. This marked the conclusion of the preliminary hearing. The Trial the fervor surrounding the case reached such heights that a decision was made to conduct the trial in the prestigious Old Bailey Courthouse in central London. Without delay, the authorities set the hearing for February 21st, a mere two weeks after Fielding's intensive questioning. The presiding judge was the Lord Mayor of London, Crisp Gascoigne, and the panel consisted of some of the most eminent judges of the era. Susanna Wells and Mary Squires took their places as the defendants in the courtroom. In an attempt to establish her innocence, Squires presented three witnesses who attested that she was indeed absent from London, residing in Abbotsbury at the time of the alleged kidnapping. However, the jury remained unconvinced by her claims. In the end, both Romani women were pronounced guilty. Squires received the grim sentence of death by hanging, while Wells faced immediate partial punishment she was branded in the courtroom. Her agonizing screams and curses, though intense, were largely drowned out by the applause and cheers of the spectators. Following this dramatic moment, Mary collapsed and was subsequently transported to Newgate Prison, where she was to serve a six-month sentence. At first glance, it appeared that justice had been served, but had it truly. Revisiting the case Sir Crispin Gascoigne, who had presided over the previous trial, reluctantly accepted the panel's verdict but continued to harbor doubts regarding the final judgment. He couldn't shake the feeling that the trial had been marred by bias and amounted to a grave miscarriage of justice. Thus, he took it upon himself to seek the truth. Gascoigne penned a letter to the vicar of Abbotsbury, inquiring about the three witnesses who could corroborate Mrs. Squire's alibi. The vicar vouched for these men as upstanding citizens, and their accounts were found to be credible. Even after the trial, they steadfastly maintained that the convicted Mary Squires had indeed been in their company on New Year's Eve and in the days that followed. Furthermore, Gascoigne conducted an interview with Virtue Hall, who had evaded the trial. Nervously, she confessed that she had perjured herself against Squires to avoid imprisonment. Upon conversing with Susanna Wells in her cell and probing her about the events surrounding that fateful day, the Lord Mayor became firmly convinced that Wells and Squires had indeed suffered a grave miscarriage of justice. Thanks to Gascoigne's unwavering efforts, Squires received a pardon just one day before her scheduled execution, and together with Wells, they were released from incarceration. The nation stood divided, with the Canningites staunchly believing that Wells and Squires were guilty and had imprisoned Elizabeth Canning, while the Egyptians insisted that Elizabeth Canning was a deceiver. In May 1754, the campaigners succeeded in convincing the authorities that Elizabeth Canning had fabricated her account, leading to her being charged with perjury. The second trial, an intricate web of witnesses and conflicting testimonies, merits a distinct article of its own as the jury grappled with a staggering number of details. 
For instance, the first day of the trial alone saw the testimony of 39 witnesses. Mrs. Squire's whereabouts fluctuated like Schrodinger's cat, appearing and disappearing in entirely different locations. Meanwhile, Canning's character was portrayed alternately as that of an innocent lamb or the most promiscuous of girls who had enticed a dozen men. The case brimmed with inconsistencies on both the prosecution and defense sides, leaving the jury in a state of disarray. It took them nearly two hours to reach a verdict, ultimately finding Canning guilty of perjury, but not willfully. However, the court refused to accept this verdict, effectively pressing on, and Elizabeth was ultimately declared guilty of willful perjury. On July 31, 1754, Canning was convicted and subsequently sentenced to exile in America for seven years. She never returned, instead marrying and starting a family, living a modest and devout life there until her sudden passing at the age of 39. The perplexing question of what truly transpired on the night of New Year's Day 1753 has remained elusive. Despite the efforts of later researchers, none have been able to unravel the intricacies of this baffling story. The enigma of whether she was indeed kidnapped or had concocted the tale, and the unexplained injuries and her whereabouts for those four weeks, persists. In the words of judge and author John Paget, in truth, this is probably the strangest and most inexplicable forensic puzzle in history. I hope you liked this story. Please don't forget to leave a comment sharing with your thoughts below. Give a thumbs up this video, and remember to hit that subscribe button to stay tuned for more captivating stories. Thank you for joining us on this remarkable journey, and we'll see you in the next video.